Greetings students and welcome to this episode of The Professor Travel. I am The Professor Travel welcoming you again. This is the website, this is the blog, and this is the podcast that you come to in order to learn more about different destinations. Together we learn more, we discuss more as a community, we travel more, hopefully to all different types of destinations and places that you may not have even thought about, and ultimately to enjoy more. Come back as a community and be able to share those experiences with everybody. Now you can reach me on my website at scott at uh, theprofessortravel.com or you can just reach me on that website at theprofessortravel.com. I can also be seen on YouTube at The Professor Travel. Uh, same with Facebook and uh, on Twitter, I can be reached at the um, Twitter at uh, the Professor TR one So find me there, it's a little bit different. And then finally, for those who are bloggers, you can see me at theprofessortravel.blogspot.com. Now today I have a very special visiting professor in my students. Uh, this is Professor Riffer. Say hi, Randy. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Randy, and thank you for coming. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you again. Um, can you share a little bit about yourself, maybe some educational background and some places that you travel to? Um, yeah, my educational background is I have an associate's degree in business, um, and that's kind of my education piece. I've traveled, um, a lot of Caribbean travel is a lot of what I do. Um, previous to that, I've obviously visited um, a, lot of, a, lot of, or, uh, a lot of states within the United States, you know, um, but most of my um, recent travel has been to the Caribbean. And that's really where we're going to focus on for the purpose of this specific episode. Uh, so you decided that you wanted to take a cruise from New York to the Caribbean and back. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. Awesome. Well, tell us a little bit about the whole planning stage. When did you decide to do this? When was this going to occur? And what were some considerations that you were thinking about as you started to make those plans? Um, one thing that I do is I'm constantly looking for great deals when it comes to cruising. And um, so really the planning on this particular cruise started probably in early summer. So I'm going to say right around June time frame. We actually didn't sell in, or I'm sorry, this is this was a different cruise, but anyway, we started this early in the year in January. Um, we're looking for a good price, so I kind of look at it every week, and we were looking to go in the spring. So what I do is I check every week, trying to find the best deal. What I've learned is, you know, you go in, you look at that price on a website, what, what the actual price is, and then what I do is that's my starting point, my baseline, and I track it, and once I find a good deal, that's kind of when I go ahead and I lock in the price. Now, let me ask you this. When you're, when you're working with websites and there's so many different strategies people have, are you going directly to the cruises website or are you going to like a travel aggregator site? Like there are a lot of them out there that have discounted travel prices. I actually go to uh, one specific website. It's cruise.com. Okay. And, right. I, and it, what I like about that site is you can actually pick where you're interested in going, what port you want to go, go from. And the good thing about leaving from New York, when you put in New York, it also pulls in the New Jersey peers. So in one search, you're getting a, a wide variety of uh, different cruises. Excellent. So that gives you a lot of variety. How many cruise lines actually do leave from New York? Do you know? New York, there's quite a few. I'm thinking six or seven. Okay. Um, but, but this particular cruise that we went on in April, um, it was from Cape Liberty in, in New Jersey. Okay. And that's Royal Caribbean's uh, specific cruise port. Okay, perfect. So you decided to go on Royal Caribbean. Now, uh, which ship was it that you decided to use um, this time around? Uh, the Anthem of the Seas. Anthem of the Seas. So that's one of the larger Oasis class ships, isn't it? That's correct. There's uh, 40, 4,800 passengers. That's huge. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to definitely ask you a lot of questions about that because there are some people who like the really small ships, there's something like mid-sized ships, but when you get into those Oasis class ships, and there's going to be one that's going to be released, I think, later this year, I think called the Odyssey of the Season, that's going to be out of Asia. And it's, again, it's going to be like over 5,000 passengers, so it's going to be massive. But it's one of those things that, I guess it depends on what you're into. Do you want that more intimate feeling? Do you want a larger, you know, area so you can do more things? What was it that attracted you to something of this, of an Oasis class size ship? I wanted to experience the difference between a small ship and a big ship. Um, and I had, it has a lot of the new technology as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the, I guess the thing that drew me to it was the fact that I heard a lot, of, a lot about Royal Caribbean, a lot about the ship itself. And I just wanted to experience, the, again, the, the, the mere size of the ship. 
Yeah, that's, not, that's kind of one of those things that I'm thinking about. Um, uh, we're thinking about going to the Caribbean in, I want to say, uh, maybe like March of this year, of, of mm -hmm. this next year coming up. Uh -huh. And so we've been looking at Royal Caribbean and specifically the Symphony of the Seas, because as of right now, it's like the largest ship in the world. But yeah. I'm kind of curious to see how that will look. Um, pricing wise, it's not the least expensive, but it's again, one of those things that you kind of, do you really want to try that monstrous type of ship and see what the experience is like? So uh, we'll talk about your experiences in just a minute, but heading down to the Caribbean, was there a need for any type of special circumstances? Like, uh, did you need a travel visa? Did you need any type of travel medications? Uh, did you have to take time to adjust to your diet plans or anything like that? Was there anything like that? For the Caribbean, no. And the good thing about Caribbean, when you leave from New York and you return to New York, you can uh, actually, the only documentation you need is you can use an enhanced driver's license or you can use a government issued, uh, like a driver's license and a birth certificate. Okay, perfect. Awesome. So let's talk about the beginning of this vacation then. Uh, whenever we get started, we do the pre-packing process. Some people are heavy packers and pack for every situation. Other people are very light packers. Where do you find yourself in that type of situation? Uh, very heavy packer. <laughs> so you're getting ready for anything. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Uh, are there any type of things that you just that you say, you know what, I'm just going to leave that behind because I'll pick, up a, I'll pick up something when I get down to my destination so I don't have to worry about lugging it with me all the way through? Or like, how, how is your feel? What is your feeling on that? Um, usually, no, I pack everything. I mean, I bring everything myself. Um, and the only thing that I might look to buy would be like some of the toiletry stuff. You know, I'll buy them in a, in a port like sunscreen and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But usually I'm the type of guy that's going to pack everything. That's why I have, you know, three pieces, three, four pieces of luggage for a, a seven day cruise. <laughs> you know, and that actually makes sense to me. I'm one of those people that I don't know if I'd want to prepack sunscreen because you use so much of it. I might as well just buy an entire bottle when I get there. But again, if you buy something on the ship, for example, that can get exorbitant. The prices of everything is like five times the normal price that they charge anyways. So it can get crazy. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, but I, usually, I don't buy it on the ship. I'll buy it in one of, you know, like in one of the islands in the Bahamas where it's obviously much more reasonable. Makes sense. Now you're heading on down. Now uh, for, for my listeners who are not in the know, you're not, you don't live directly in the New York City area. You live further north than that, correct? Right. I'm like by three hours, three hours from the city itself. Yes. Okay. So which air or uh, you, you didn't actually have to do an airport situation. You actually just, I assume, drove directly down to the port. Or did you have a friend drive you or did you use an Uber or a taxi? How did you get down there? Uh, we actually, um, well, it's a kind of an interesting story, a short story, and I'll share it with everybody. Again, being that there was a group of us, there was a group of um, six of us. So we had to take two vehicles. And um, the, the plan was for a friend to drive. The problem was the luggage wouldn't fit in his vehicle. So last minute we had to decide I had more cargo space than my SUV. So I drove. Okay. Um, so that's kind of, and then we all meet together uh, and then we just drive down two cars following each other. And this particular travel down was the first time we've ever experienced any kind of issue with the travel. I actually blew a flat tire and, <gasps> and you know, that's kind of freaks you out because you want to get to the ship. Um, but that kind of set us back an hour, but that was the first time in all my trips to New York city, anything has ever happened like that. Oh no. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry that that happened to you, but it sounds like you made your destination and, and your embarkation time. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the embarkation process. You, you get to the Anthem. Um, by the way, did you have to, I assume you ended up paying for parking while you were on the trip and just left your vehicle there? Yeah, right at the Cape Liberty in New Jersey. It's in Bayonne, New Jersey. Um, it's right across the Hudson from Manhattan. Mm -hmm. um, they actually, Royal Caribbean has their own parking garage. So you park, you pay right there, and it's very convenient. Do you remember about how much it was? I believe it was, for the seven day, it was $100. That for seven is day extremely cruise. good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, when we went on a trip recently um, out of Los Angeles, well, again, uh, I, I, shouldn't re I should rephrase that. We went on a cruise from Rome to Venice, but we left, we, we took a flight from Los Angeles over to... Uh, Rome via Stockholm and for us to park our car there it was about $250 for about 12 days so when I hear anything under like thousand dollars <laughs> I'm gonna be very happy <laughs> sure, I hear, I hear you <laughs> yes. all right so um, so how long did the embarkation process 
you to get on board the ship? Actually, for the mere size of the ship, and you're talking, you know, 45 to 4,800 passengers, the process is very streamlined, very efficient, the way they have it set up. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say by the time we parked, dropped our luggage off, we were on the ship within 45 minutes. Very nice. That's, yeah. that's not too bad. I mean, it's, it, they can obviously do a little bit better, but again, sure. I think it depends on the port and, the, and where you're at. I, I've, I've, seen, I've seen embarkation processes that take less than 10 minutes. So, I mean, oh, again, depending okay. on, but, but like you said, and it shouldn't be a surprise, maybe the size of the ship has an impact on how long the embarkation process can take too. So yeah. that's true. Yeah. Yep. All right, so no flights were involved in this at all. Uh, so we're not gonna worry about that or pre-vacation destinations or, but let's talk about the accommodations on the ship itself. So what kind of a room did you end up getting? Okay, I had a uh, balcony room. Balcony, excellent. Yes. And so, you know, it's just, I assume, was it just two of you in the room or did you have more than that? Uh, and we each, we all had our own room. We all had balcony rooms and there was two in a room. Okay, perfect. What did you think of the balcony for the price that you ended up paying? Was it worth it? The price was very, very, like I said, the price is what drove me to book the cruise. And that's why actually I, I um, upgraded to a balcony because okay. the price was so reasonable. And I definitely felt it was well worth the money. And this and it was very spacious. Okay, very nice. Okay, so let's talk about what your itinerary was. Because uh, the one thing I always worry about on cruises is you have sometimes where you have a lot of sea days. Um, other times you have those court intensive vacations where it's like every single day you're going to a new port so there's almost no downtime talk to me a little bit about your itinerary and and which destinations you ended up going to and maybe we can take a little bit of time to uh just take a snippet from each destination that you went to to kind of elaborate on that okay um the the itinerary started obviously uh out of new york mm -hmm. it was a two two days at sea and our first stop was um cape canaveral florida okay um and in that, that particular or what I typically do is stay on the ship and let everybody else get off because obviously I've, I mean, I've traveled to Florida. There's really nothing for me that I really care to see. And I took full advantage of the first part to, to be able to explore the ship with most of the people off of it. Can I ask you a question about that? Sure. Normally when people have um, stay at destination ports, so in this particular case, you decided to stay on board the ship and not go, not go on uh, to Port Canaveral. Um, there's usually some deals that the that the cruise line will do in order to entice you to stay on board, whether it's discounts on spas or other things that are going on. Do you remember, um, I mean, obviously besides just doing a tour of the ship while the cruise was in port, did you, did you take advantage of any type of specials that they had going on? The only thing that we took advantage of is uh, on the Anthem, they actually have what they call the North Star. And that is a big glass tube that goes, it's like an arm on top of the ship and it goes way up. And it's a big glass bubble that you're able to, you know, to see everything at a very high level, including the top deck of the ship. Mm -hmm. um, we took advantage of that because obviously when the ship is full and at sea, there's a line waiting for that. Excellent. Did they have, um, I wasn't sure if they had the flow rider on that ship or anything like that. Yep, they have the flow rider as well. All, all those were running. The only thing that I noticed uh, in Port Canaveral was the dining rooms were closed. Oh, the only thing that was open for eating on those days was the buffet. Okay, how was the buffet? The buffet was very, for a buffet, was very, very good. Um, and the way it's set up is they have stations throughout the buffet. Mm -hmm. Like if you want salads, fruits, hot meals, meats, it's all, all segmented. So the line, there's really no lines. You're just skipping from, you know what I mean? From island to island to get what you want. We had something very similar to that on our last cruise, and I was kind of I was kind of curious why they did that. And I was listening to um, a I was listening to Doug Parker's show, and on his show they had another person who used Celebrity, and Celebrity and uh, Royal Caribbean are owned by the same company. And the what and like you had said, the reason that they do that is to cut down on line traffic rather than if you just had one line that was going throughout the buffet all the way around, having those smaller lines makes it a little bit easier for you to get that slice of pizza or that you know piece of whatever that you want uh, without having to wait through this massive line to go through that. Yep. So yeah, it makes more sense to do it in smaller lines with that. And that actually kind of sold me on the small line theory. So that was kind of cool too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay, so that's Port Canaveral for you. Okay, where was your next destination? We're gonna uh, the next destination was Nassau, Bahamas. Okay, how was uh, Nassau? Nassau, um, again, there's, one thing about Nassau, you're usually, 
going to be there with two or three other ships. So it's quite congested, congested until you get through customs. And then once you're through customs, you can you know, kind of go any way you want. Um, in that particular destination, we did book an online excursion. Um, and it was, we were kind of looking, again, it wasn't my first time to Nassau, so looking at something just to do. Um, so besides spending time in the straw market and all that type of touristy stuff, once you get off the ship, we did a, um, a catamaran boat ride out to where they get you onto a submarine and you get to see the wildlife uh, in the Caribbean. Um, but I will tell you, you get what you pay for. It was uh, low budget and it looked like, unfortunately, a submarine that was probably retired from Disney World 20 years ago. Uh, so it wasn't a good experience. <laughs> Sorry about that. I did want to ask you, because I've heard some things about Nassau and the aggressiveness of some of the merchants as you get off this ship. Did you experience anything like that when you were there? You do. Once you go through customs, yes, you're getting people trying to sell you stuff. Your typical, you know, they want to braid your hair if, if you had hair. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, where I found the pressure is when you go into the straw markets. You know, everyone's trying to lure you in to buy their product, um, and, but you can definitely barter. Um, but that's where I felt the most pressure. I also went to uh, downtown Nassau, which is kind of a great experience. Very, a very busy, uh, like a main street. Um, a lot of good deals, shops, clothing, restaurants. But, but the only thing, like I say, on the Nassau, the touristy places right off the pier, you're, and the straw market, you are, you're going to get that pressure. Yes. Um, did you have any food or drink while you were there? I'm sorry, what? Did you have any food or drink while you were there? Uh, not off the ship, no. Okay. So you pretty much just arranged for that. Okay, yep. perfect. And how long did you spend in Nassau? How, what was, the, was it early morning to late evening or was it just like a four hour, six hour stint? No, we got there I think 9 a.m. and I think we left around 7 p.m. Okay, perfect. So it was kind of a full day. Awesome, very nice. Um, did, by the way, when you, were on the, when you were on the ship, did you do any specialty dining, any of the specialty restaurants there? Uh, yeah, we did Chop Steakhouse, which was fantastic. And we did the Italian specialty restaurant, and I can't remember the name right now, but both were fantastic. Is that Giovanni? Well worth the money. What's that? I, I was wondering, is that Giovanni's? Or no? Maybe that's a different one. Yes, yes it was. I think it was. It was. Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Awesome. And you did you have a good, ex was it worth the price that you paid for the premium in order to go to the specialty restaurant? Definitely. Yes. The, the, the atmosphere, the experience, the, you know, that whole extra attention you get from the wait staff mm -hmm. uh, and the food was, the food was phenomenal. Excellent. I highly recommend both of those restaurants on the Anthem. Well, I, uh, well, they have them on the symphony as well. So I'm going to be very curious about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's Nassau. What was your next destination? Now, the next one's got a little story behind it. Um, we were all very um, excited because if, if for the students that don't know this, um, Royal Caribbean has a private island in the Bahamas and it's called Coco Cay. So what they've been doing is they've been investing a lot of money in it um, to, they added a water park, they have a lot of private beach area with cabanas. So it's, it's under development. So uh, they just built their own pier. They used to tether and you'd have to obviously take, take a boat in. Um, but they just built a new pier and the Anthem of the Sea, the cruise that we were on were the, was the first ship to dock. And it was, they were concerned because it was obviously the largest ship to dock at the pier. Um, so that was, that was uh, the big excitement of, of the trip, making history. Um, but the Coco Cay is a phenomenal island. And now that it's done, it's, a, it's kind of a must see on anyone that's going to the Caribbean. Yeah, I've heard yeah. really great things about Coco. Well, okay, so here's the other thing I hear about it too. So the natives pronounce it Coco Key, which is not how the which which is not how the um, cruise lines reported it because it's pronounced because it's they pronounce it Coco K, and they even they even call it a perfect day in Coco K. But it, it's <laughs> the natives are like no, it's pronounced Key. So there's still that debate on how to even pronounce that. Um, and if you go to I think Royal Caribbean's website or their or you listen on their phone when you call them they pronounce it a perfect day on Coco Key until you get to like some of the further in areas like if you're going calling customer service and you drill down into that they do actually have some recording that says perfect day on Coco K. so it's like okay. well you guys really need to change that on your stuff yeah. all the way around if you're going to do it so yeah. all right so so that's perfect day perfect um and how, was it the full day ex excursion or 
Yeah, it was, it was a full day. I think it was kind of the same as Nassau. We arrived there about, I think it was a little earlier, eight in the morning. And actually, um, they had to do a, um, an emergency. So it kind of took us off course a little while. They had to heliport somebody off the, off the ship. So what they did is they let us stay two hours longer. So we were going to leave at five. I think we stayed till seven that day due to that inconvenience. Oh wow, that's 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 really amazing. Uh, yeah. You know, so I know I know sometimes people are like, oh gosh, you know, I, I hate it when that happens. But at the end of the day, if someone's in a life-threatening situation, you want to make sure they get off the ship as quickly as possible. It can be a little bit of an inconvenience, but sometimes the cruise ships will do what they can in order to accommodate that. They're not required to, but they will oftentimes do what they can in order to help out. Yep, and um, they did that for us, and that was, it was much appreciated. I guess what happened is somebody had to, had a pen, they had to actually teleport them off the ship, get them to a hospital, and they went through surgery. Oh and they made God. a big announcement thanking us all, and, you know, and apologizing for the inconvenience. But I mean, you're right; it happens more times than often, and usually, a lot of times, they won't make it up. But this is something they did for us, and again, it was appreciated by all the passengers. Okay, you know, I don't even think I asked you this earlier um, when. When you went over to Coco Cay, now this is going to be they're they're both pretty much around the Bahamas. But did did you did they have merchants as you got off the ship that kind of accost you like they do at Nassau, or is it more of a this is owned by Royal Caribbean, so they want to make sure the experience is like a fully fledged customer service happiness Disney kind of moment type thing. Yep, you're not you're not, the like you say you get off you have all you still have your straw market your souvenirs but there's no pressure whatsoever you can walk up look around you want to buy something you find somebody and say I'd like to get this very little pressure. Excellent. Um, did you get anything any food or drink while you were at uh, Perfect Day? Actually, um, we rented a cabana, a private cabana on the private beach. There were six of us, and with that came came kind of you pre-ordered what you wanted served and they they brought the food to your cabana for you so yeah we ate we had the the bar right there you know so you had your 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 alcohol package you you're able to you know obviously have all you want there so that was very nice on that same note now with with coco k because that's that's owned by royal caribbean you were able to use your cards from the ship on coco k is that correct you didn't even need anything because obviously the only way you got there is by the anthem of the sea um, so yeah, there was no kind of, you didn't have to prove anything other than if you had the alcohol package, obviously you had to use your, they have wristbands that they use because they have new technology on that ship. So you just showed your wristband and you were good to go, but that's the only thing you needed for the alcohol portion. Excellent. And I was going to ask, well, did you just go with the basic package or did you go with the more advanced package? Just the basic package. Good enough. Um, all right. So that's Coco K. Where did you go after that? After that, it was just two more days of sea back to New York. Excellent. Um, and you felt the cost was worth it for you? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I, like I say, I shop for price. Mm -hmm. And usually I look if anything is $100 a day or less is a great deal. Um, and this was with, for a balcony room was less than $100 a day. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So then you're back in the Bayonne area. You're, you're in the New York area. Um, talk to me a little bit about the disembarkation process and the return. How long did that take for you? Um, was there any problem with the bags? Uh, what was it like? Okay, the disembark is, is, again, pretty efficient. It's not 10 minutes like you talked about on your one cruise when you were getting on the ship. Um, but what they do is they obviously, you know, they take the luggage the night before. And then um, what you have to do is you have a staging area. You, you can go eat, do what you got to do. Then you go to your staging area. Once your number is called, you're able to get off the ship. Um, it's, it's very efficient with all these passengers because once you leave the ship, your luggage is there, you grab the luggage, you go through customs again, and you're in the parking ramp. So I'm going to say within 30 minutes, again, you're in your car on your way home. That's awesome. Yeah, they, that's, I mean, again, for the number of pieces of luggage and the time it takes for all those passengers, in my opinion, it's very impressive on how efficient and smooth that it runs. Wonderful. So let's talk about your takeaways from this trip. What were some of the pros? Like, it, like obviously you keep going there, so there's definitely pros for you. Yeah, there's, a, I mean, again, the, the pros, I would say just the mere size of the ship, all the passengers, and very few lines for any of the things that you wanted to go to. Um, the, they have the ship designed and the itinerary designed in a way that you don't feel like there's that many passengers on the ship. 
I think the other pros based on other experiences would be the embark and the disembark process, um, in my opinion, was very efficient, very trouble free. Um, and I think the other pro is the ability to get on the ship at 11 o'clock, even though you don't take off until three or four uh, in your restaurants and your drink, everything starts as soon as you get on the ship. Nice. Um, was there like a promenade or an area in the center of the ship kind of to make it a, a feel like a larger ship or was it something that you just had like the normal area where the, where the, where the uh, shops were? Yeah, exactly. When you get on, all the shops are there. It's like their main street, you know, all their specialty shops. Uh, they do have one area of the ship where you could, um, it's like a glass, it's on the top floor. It's like a glass floor where you can experience how high up you are. Um, but that's that's one thing that Royal Caribbean doesn't have on the anthem. It doesn't have the big promenade where you can see from, you know, the fourth floor to the top. Okay. And while you were on the ship, did you happen to engage in any entertainment? Did you see any shows, anything like that? Uh, yeah, actually, that's one big pro with Royal Caribbean that I found is they truly have Broadway uh, caliber shows. Uh, there was The Gift. There was We Will Rock You. There were two of the really good shows. Um, and if, if I compare that to when I traveled to the city to see a Broadway show, mm -hmm. very comparable. Oh, wow. Yes. That's very, very good. And um, the Royal Caribbean, because this, that's the thing about the theater, is you have to reserve those. It's, it's not like some ships, you can just show up. They have two shows at night. Um, on, the, on the anthem, you actually had a book, you know, one of the shows. Okay, so it's, it's your advice. Anybody going to these things in advance, you have to book. It's just, there's just no other way. And I suggest that you book before, obviously, as soon as you can. Uh, once, once I think it's within 30 to 60 days of the cruise, you can you can book all those online, all your entertainment. Perfect. So, not that there's any major cons or detractors from this, but if there was anything that you would want a first-time person going on this itinerary that you spoke about to know about, what would you say they should know about? Um, well, one of the things that I just mentioned is to make sure that you you look in that 30 to 60 day window before the cruise leaves, you know, you go onto their website when you're looking at your cruise documentation and all that kind of uh, stuff that they put out there for you, really look and spend time, even the specialty dining, to book whatever you can in advance. Because the problem is once you get on the ship, there's only one customer service counter. And if you have any issues, you're gonna stand in line, taken away from your vacation of four or five hours realistically on any given day to wait in line. I've been there. I understand yeah. that pain. <laughs> um, any like uh, so, as far as value adds and, and cost savings, you went through cruise.com. Is there any other uh, travel aggregator sites that you use in order to book your cruises, or are you pretty pretty good with them? Yeah, I've always used cruise.com. I can't say. I, I mean, I've done some comparables to the actual cruise line websites, um, and you, you usually. They're pretty comparable at the same day when you're looking at the price. What you find is some additional perks on what 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 one site is offering versus cruise.com. Usually uh, what I found with cruise.com is if, if Royal Caribbean is giving you a $50 room credit, um, cruise.com might be giving you a hundred. Oh, wow. So there are differences there. And the other, the other thing that I, I think when I'm looking at a cruise is I hear horror stories of people, first time cruisers that are looking to cruise and they're just going out there and they're booking that room without doing any comparison or any tracking of that price. Uh, Cause I know there's people that actually went on this ship that we talked to at the pool that paid three times as much as we did by waiting for that 120 days before we booked just by watching it. Uh, and that's another thing I wanted to ask you about. Um, so there's a difference between booking and paying for your cruise right away and just book, just putting the deposit down and maybe waiting and, and, and getting a better deal as you go through that process. Is that what, is that what you did or? Actually, I usually um, just book and pay the whole thing. Okay. But yes, the same opportunity comes up where that's a big special. Sometimes they offer again, depending on how early you book, you know, you can, you can actually book a cruise for as little as $50 down and make payments. Um, but because I wait until it's, you know, until I, I watch that price maybe for six months, when I get, when I know the price is rock bottom, I just book it and pay it at that point. That makes sense. The other thing I was going to also ask you is, are you a member of a loyalty program like with Royal Caribbean or do you use other uh, cruise lines and their different loyalty programs as well? Um, I ha Well, you, you're talking about like the, the points you get for cruising. Yes. Um, I'm at a silver level with Royal. 
um, but I do take advantage of those um, through the other two cruise lines I've cruised with as well. Okay. So I'm, I'm trying to, I guess, increase my repertoire of different ships and different cruise lines. Now that I've experienced the three major ones from the East Coast, mm -hmm. that's my plan is to get to the next status to take advantage of obviously more perks, the, the better or the higher rating that you get. And when you say three major ones, you're referring to Carnival, Norwegian, and Royal Caribbean? That is correct, yep. Okay, perfect. Yep. Awesome. Well, Randy, I wanted to say thank you very much. Um, again, if anybody has any questions or concerns, uh, you could certainly, or comments, you could certainly send them to me at scott at theprofessortravel.com. In the meantime, I want to thank my guest, Randy, uh, for, for taking the time out of his very busy schedule to join me for this wonderful debrief on the Caribbean. Again, thank you, Randy. And uh, to my students, uh, make, every, make every adventure that you have a travel adventure. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks, Bye.